before I even knew what emotional resilience was as a word, as a, as a phrase, um, I was practicing it. I was looking at ways to uh, help my own, help myself to be more resilient. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more of that, about that as we go through this workshop. Um, it's something that's been very close to my heart for a very, very long time. Having said that, I would never call myself an expert in emotional resilience because I think it's such a huge field and there's so much more to learn. I am constantly learning more about what it means to uh, work in this way, to be able to practice emotional resilience. And I would say it's not a destination. Emotional resilience isn't a destination that you get to and they think, yay, I'm emotionally resilient. Um, <laughs> or work with a client and they get to a point where they are emotionally resilient. It is a constant continuous practice rather than a destination. I would really invite your questions and conversation throughout this session. So if you have questions, uh, I'll invite the moments to, to, to come in with, with questions. But if you have questions that are really burning about what I've just said, then please put them in the chat box and I will try and um, incorporate some of those as we go through this session. So I think that's probably enough to start with. Um, just again, just a welcome to everyone here. Um, if you have uh, your noise in the background, so I'm gonna mute someone. There we go. So if you know you've got noise in your background, please keep on mute. Um, but otherwise, you know, just come into the space. And it's lovely to have as many videos on in the space as possible. I'm going to be talking a little bit to start off with about definitions of emotional resilience um, because it's useful to get a sense of what it means, maybe the history of it as well, and, and what it looks like. So what does someone who looks like, you know, what, what does someone who is emotionally resilient, what do they look like? <coughs> and when we explore that, it's not so much about having all of those qualities, but certainly um, working towards those qualities. Um, and then we're going to start to unpack what it means for us to start to um, uh, cultivate some of those aspects of emotional resilience. And we'll lean into a few of those aspects. And then towards the end of the session, I hope to just bring in some tools and techniques we can use to help ourselves and help our clients to uh, cultivate emotional resilience in different areas. So let's begin. Oh, we'll have some breakout rooms as well. It's much nice to have breakout rooms, isn't it? So, a few breakout rooms to discuss some of these aspects too. So unpacking emotional resilience a bit. So resilience, and this is a quote that I came across which really resonated with me. It's a very, uh, it's a very broad area, emotional resilience, and a lot of uh, definitions have been made on specific areas of emotional resilience, but this feels uh, like quite a, a full picture, a full definition, if you like. Resilience is the ability to overcome adversity. That's really a good definition, but what does it mean for ourselves? At the heart of resilience is a belief in oneself. Resilient people do not let adversity define them. They find resilience by moving towards a goal and beyond themselves, transcending pain and grief by perceiving bad times as a temporary state of affairs. It's possible to strengthen your inner self and your belief in yourself, to define yourself as capable and competent. It's possible to fortify your psyche. It's possible to develop a sense of mastery. And really, you know, this is a, as I said before, this is a journey. This is a, a process of growth and continual work. Um, I've just seen a question from Marlon. Um, the slides will be available. I'm not sure how we'll make them available, but we will make them available um, to everyone um, after this presentation. And we'll be adding to those as well. So this is uh, a, definition, a definition of emotional resilience. And it's not that emotional uh, no, emotionally resilient people don't um, get uh, thrown or um, uh, find you know, situations challenging or find themselves in heap on the floor <laughs> um, and, and, and really struggling, but it's about how they bounce back. It's about how they um, meet that challenge, um, how they bounce back from that challenge. 
So where did this idea of emotional resilience come from? <clears throat> the term really originated in the 1970s, 1960s, 1970s, um, when various researchers and psychologists recognized that some people showed a particularly marked resilience to disaster or significant changes in their lives. Professor Martin Seligman of um, the, uh, you know, the, the sort of father, the godfather, if you like, of positive psychology, um, was one of those pioneer pioneering professionals at the time. In the 1960s, his research into learnt helplessness led to research and papers on learnt optimism or emotional resilience. I think that's a really interesting um, use of words, learnt optimism or emotional resilience. The idea of learnt optimism feels somewhat um, clunky to me, somewhat um, I'm going to learn how to be optimistic and it's going to be something I'm going to do. Whereas emotional resilience, I find a much more holistic uh, way of thinking, a much more holistic um, expression of, uh, a, a much more, I suppose, holistic and you know, containing the whole body and emotions and mind, as it were, when you're meeting something challenging. He used his research in combating depression in young people and he eventually delivered courses on master resilience training to the US Army. And that training was uh, focused on four particular points. Beliefs, um, which is around A to F from Ellis's work, which many of you will be, will be familiar with. Um, thinking traps, again, which many of you will be familiar with from, for example, the work that we do um, in coaching um, around uh, the words that we use, the uh, distortions and deletions that we get um, absorbed by and the generalizations. He also looked at strengths, so leaning into and noticing strengths within the individual and also growth mindset and the work of Carol Dweck. So this work around, around emotional resilience has been uh, built on very significantly over the intervening years um, by all sorts of different writers, coaches, psychologists, self-help books and so on. But it's interesting that um, in the work, uh, in the research for this, I noticed that many of these techniques um, for improving emotional resilience have actually been around for centuries. So for example, the ideas around uh, mindfulness and meditation, which can really um, reinforce our emotional resilience have been around for centuries, for thousands of years. Um, and this questioning and getting perspective and questioning of ourselves as individuals. Um, these have all been around for many, many years, but we are now starting to recognize the value of them and to start to um, uh, bring them into this idea of uh, building and cultivating emotional resilience. <clears throat> and one of the things that I noticed um, in my work around this and in the exploration of this is that it is very much a human question. It's very much a human um, journey to explore this idea of resilience. And in fact, when we look at uh, resilience in other areas, um, we see it all around us. And I'm just going to show you a picture here. Nature can be our teacher. I came across this when I was on a dog walk recently, and it really spoke to me of resilience. Here we have a beautiful ash tree that has fallen over in a storm or a huge wind. It's fallen over, it's created a space in the forest. And yet, despite the fact that it has fallen over, despite the fact that it seems to have ended its life um, through a storm or through high, high winds or whatever, um, it has shown its natural resilience. And um, we have, you know, here, um, two ash trees growing out of the trunk of this fallen tree. And I know that there are also many more um, growing out of the trunk further along. And not only that, but it, this has also created the space and the opportunity for a silver birch tree to grow out of the root ball of this same fallen ash tree. And I think this really speaks of um, how, despite our weatheredness despite our wounds and perhaps because of them we can come back we can uh, discover our resilience um, and 
become more than we think we are. And interestingly, one of the aspects that this, I think, shows for us is that adversity is not something to be afraid of. Adversity and challenge in our lives are something that we can really embrace as an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to cultivate more resilience, to cultivate and learn more about ourselves. And in fact, we learn so much more about ourselves through those challenges, through those adverse situations than we do when life is fine. Because when life is fine, we just get on with it. We don't question, we don't have to self-examine. But when life throws us challenges and throws us difficulties, then we have this in incredible opportunity for growth and change. And those challenges that come for us, those adverse situations, may be external, maybe the death of a loved one or climate change or loss of a job or all sorts of different things. Or there may be those challenges may show up within us, um, maybe with um, internal negative talk or um, uh, anxiety or many other issues that come up for us. So nature can be our teacher. We look around us, we see this all over the place. I encourage you the next time you go for a walk in the countryside, look out for the resilience of nature, look out for how uh, nature comes back. I think, and I don't know if anyone saw uh, the documentary on Chernobyl um, that was quite recent um, and how extraordinary uh, nature has taken over that site in a far, a far quicker time than anyone thought possible. And it is thriving. Uh, there's been huge adverse situation in that place. And yet nature has come back um, with abundance. So nature can be our teacher. So coming back to emotional resilience. What are the qualities of someone with emotional resilience? There are many, many qualities. And so I'm gonna to start to unpack some of these. So we have hopefulness. Someone who is emotionally resilient will naturally be hopeful. We're gonna to start to we'll unpack that one a little bit more later on. Someone who is emotionally resilient has a sense of gratitude. And I should frame this by saying that everything in these slides has been um, taken from research into emotional resilience, it's not just my, my viewpoint, <laughs> my personal take on emotional resilience, and there's some of that in there, but uh, by and large, all the slides that we have today um, are based on um, research um, that has been done into emotional resilience um, over looking at thousands of people. Um, and the resources at the end of these slides um, will show you, give you some of the background to this research. So someone who is emotionally resilient will have a sense of gratitude, a sense of hopefulness. Um, they will be persistent in the face of challenges. So not just dealing with one challenge, but if facing many challenges, they will show persistence. They will keep going, a sense of what you might say, grit. And there's a lovely TED talk on grit that's worth watching. Can't remember the name of it now. But persistence in the face of challenges, a sense of grit. And yet that strength that people show in the face of challenges um, also shows up in a sense of flexibility and adaptability. So there's this extraordinary strength that can come from being emotionally resilient. And yet there is a huge flexibility, psychological flexibility, emotional flexibility, and adaptability too, to different situations. And if we think about that in terms of the uncertainty in the world uh, and how you know, it seems to be 
the world is shifting and changing constantly and we are facing difficulties with climate change and so on. Uh, there is a huge need for this flexibility and adaptability, um, whether that is um, exploring alternatives, alternative ways of living, <clears throat> working out how we can adapt to a changing climate, or working out how we can um, manage this changing climate. An ability to identify resources internally and externally. So, and this is an interesting one too, in that uh, we often take for granted many of the resources that we actually have both within ourselves and outside of ourselves. But someone who is emotionally resilient um, will be able to clearly identify some of those resources, if not all of those resources, to be able to know uh, what they can depend on, what they can lean on, um, what they can access both from within themselves in terms of their own experience and skills, but also to be able to look for resources outside, whether that's asking for help or accessing those resources in a different way. Um, reflecting very much that definition, a sense of self-belief, a sense of self-esteem. So there's a sense of knowing oneself the oracle at Delphi says, know thyself. It's so important. Shakespeare talks about this as well. This idea of really understanding oneself um, and believing in oneself. And again, someone I would say who's emotionally resilient doesn't necessarily have that self-esteem all the time. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, a bounce, it's about bouncing back to that. So a sense that, yes, you will have days when you are down, you will have moments of doubt and moments of de deliberation. But essentially, there is a, a, a sense of self, a clear sense of self and a, a positive attitude towards self. And with that, an openness to experience. I think I'll put too many ends in this one, I'm not sure. Anyway, openness to experience, um, being able to... Um, and when I talk about openness to experience, I would also call that a sense of open heartedness. And like I said before, this isn't just an, an intellectual exercise of being emotionally resilient. It is a whole body experience um, and this openness of heart to all the possibilities and the experiences that we can engage with in life is really, really important. There will be an orientation towards the future. And again, an interesting way of putting it, an orientation towards the future. Um, this is someone who does not uh, spend a long time deliberating and um, going over the past, but has an orientation towards the future. Again, this is not set in stone. This is not something that is there all the time but generally there is an orientation towards the future. There is an ability to manage and contain their own emotions. And again, we'll come on to that and what that looks like, but uh, to manage and contain their own emotions. Um, and, and there are elements, and I don't know if any of you know the work of um, Daniel Gold Goldman, um, looking at emotional intelligence. There are definitely many elements of emotional intelligence in someone who is emotionally resilient but I would say that that is contained within rather than a separate entity. So someone who's able to manage and contain their own emotions um, also really needs a sense of self-awareness and again coming back to that idea of knowing oneself. We cannot uh, begin to manage and contain our own emotions if we are not self-aware. And with that, we can also become emotionally literate. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting work. Uh, Brenny Brown talks about doing this, um, doing some research uh, into emotional literacy. And I think she's, I think within the research, there was a study on about 7,000 Americans um, uh, looking at their emotional literacy. 
And when asked what emotions they felt, um, this group of people on average could only name three. Sad, mad and glad. Um, and yet, um, if we look at the research, which is ongoing, uh, research done, I think, by the Dalai Lama and a few other people, uh, which is written up by Alan Watkins in his book, Coherence. They are looking at somewhere in the region of 36,000 emotions and counting. 36,000! Um, and really, I mean, many of us know, don't know half of those, um, but that's extraordinary, 36,000. <laughs> um, so where do we stand with that? How many emotions could you name right now? I think more than three, but yeah, I saw someone holding up 10. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> yeah, I think most people can, can think of about 10. I think if we really spent a long time thinking about it, we could probably come up with maybe 20. But this aspect of emotional literacy is hugely important. I work with teenagers and um, again, the, there are huge limitations in, in how many um, emotions um, people can notice and understand uh, and notice within themselves. So, how can we then manage those and contain them if we don't know what they are, if we can't identify them? So this idea of emotional literacy is hugely important in being able to then manage and contain and deal with emotions. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few tools later on to start to unpack that and what I, what I use, and I'm sure we can come up with some other ideas between us around this idea of emotional literacy. Um, and then with this, um, oh yes, Rachel Charles, Brené Brown's At the Heart, fabulous, <laughs> great book. Um, anyway, so coming back to what else we need, hmm, sense of humour. Humour is hugely important in someone uh, who is emotionally resilient. Uh, if we cannot, um, at times, laugh at either ourselves um, or the world, <laughs> um, you know, it, it is important. Humor is one of those um, aspects of our nature that we possibly don't give enough attention to, but it is hugely valuable in um, getting perspective, in uh, looking back at situations and being able to um, see a different point of view. So a sense of humor. A sense of identity, I think I've mentioned this already when we looked at self-esteem a little bit more, but a sense of who you are, know thyself. An ability to connect on a social level, um, and we'll look a little bit more at this later on, the importance of this, the value of this. Being able to connect socially is vital to emotional resilience. And the ability to set limits and boundaries. How, uh, and I think this is also a particularly interesting one when it comes to coaching. Um, and uh, I think it, it, particularly in the helping professions, um, such as coaching, um, it can be challenging to set those boundaries, to set those limits for ourselves, but also hugely important to be able to have clear boundaries. Again, something else that Brony Brown talks about at length the usefulness and the freedom that boundaries can give us. And when we have those boundaries, we have freedom to be ourselves far more. And last but not least, a sense of purpose and meaning. Again, that in itself also helps us towards that orientation towards the future. To have a sense of purpose and meaning, a direction for our lives, a direction for who we are. So those are the qualities of someone who is emotionally resilient. And I, I kind of get the sense as we unpack that, that many of you are thinking, hmm, 
How many of those have I got? Ooh, how emotionally resilient am I? Hmm. Um, and you know, it's it's a good question to ask. It's something to really reflect on for ourselves. What of those aspects do we recognize in ourselves? What others may need a bit more work, a bit more um, input, a bit more awareness and thought and consideration. Um, but something to just consider, what else do we need within our lives in order to um, increase and improve our emotional resilience? And on that point, is there an increasing need in society for emotional, resi for emotional resilience? Um, I've got a few statistics here, mostly from the World Health Organization. mostly around sort of mental health. The prevalence of all mental disorders increased by 50% worldwide from 416 million to 615 million between 1990 and 2013. Interestingly, um, we can take that with a small pinch of salt in that <clears throat> the, we have also had a large increase in population. So, uh, the research shows that the increase, there is an increase, um, but we also have had an increase in population and also an increase in the recognition and destigmatization of mental health disorders so that they are talked about an awful lot more, they come to our attention an awful lot more. But what's also alarming is that research indicates an increase in the internalizing symptoms in girls particularly. Um, internalizing symptoms, um, showing up then as physical disorders, such as um, somatic complaints, such as headaches and stomach aches. I certainly see an awful lot of that in young people today. Um, and again, three quarters of adults report symptoms of stress, including headaches, tiredness or sleeping problems um, and so on. And there is a, a huge connection between our internal state, the emotion, the emotional resilience that we have or lack of and our physical state. That's a nice quote from Viktor Frankl from Man's Search for Meaning. Those who know how close the connection is between the state of mind of a man, his courage and hope or lack of them, and the state of immunity of his body will understand that the sudden loss of hope and courage can have a deadly effect. And he saw that firsthand, particularly in the concentration camps. But we also see it um, in a more low level way when we look at the statistics around um, general health um, within organizations and sick leave and so on. <clears throat> so moving on from that, lovely thought. Um, I would say there is an there is an increasing need in society and um, particularly among the younger, gen younger generations who are, as I said before, we're not facing so much of the um, challenges and uh, um, difficult situations that they can actually overcome. So young people are constantly being bombarded at the moment by um, situations that they have no control over. So there are adverse situations, there are challenges but those challenges often present as situations that are not within their control, within their power to be met. So, for example, social media, a broad, um, you know, you know, a broad amount of news coming their way and so on. Those are situations that they can have no control over. And so there can be a, a learned helplessness um, in those situations. And so young people are more and more um, facing situations that they can't control, that they can't meet um, and overcome. Um, I would say 30, 40 years ago, young people you know, were much more out, uh, allowed out more, allowed to do more, mm. take more risks and so on. Um, so physically you would take more risks, you're allowed to take more risks. We didn't have overwhelming amounts of health and safety. <laughs> which you know is good in some ways but you know um uh, and so we started to um you know it you know 30 40 years ago we were facing physical challenges we were facing emotional and mental challenges that were immediate and also over 
we could overcome. We could actually face them. We had control over whether we could overcome them or not. And of course, there are always going to be, going to be those situations that we don't have control over. But when we can uh, notice the situations that we do have control over and overcome them, when we can meet adversity and overcome it, that is a huge boost to our emotional resilience. So how can we create a situation or how can we change situations to provide situations of adversity that are within the control of the individual, that are within the possibility with of, you know, possible realms of um, overcoming? It's an interesting question, something to think about. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna move on from that one. That's another question to ponder on. So an overview, how do we cultivate emotional resilience? So emotional literacy is really important to express and understand what's being felt. Um, a grit, a can-do and a growth mindset, again, something we've also explored. So all of these are, as it were, um, what we need to do in order to cultivate emotional literacy <laughs> rather than what we were looking at before, which is someone who looks emotionally resilient. Finding meaning and purpose, um, finding humor in things, cultivating self-awareness, cultivating hope, nurturing a community or tribe to serve and be served by. That's an interesting one. Um, faith, a mindful practice for perspective and facing change and cultivating hope and self-awareness. So these are the elements um, that we need to cultivate in order to be more emotional resilient. And we're gonna to start to unpack some of those. We can't unpack all of them, we haven't got time, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, we're just gonna pick a few, um, but we will be picking a few of these and starting to unpack them a little bit. What does that mean? What does that look like? Um, but what I'd love to do now, I've been talking for way too long. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go into breakout rooms. Um, let me just get the breakout rooms. Now sort those out. Um, how many of us are there? Oh, 82, goodness me. Let's have um, a bunch of breakout rooms. Let's go for 24, Let's see what happens. Um, okay, so there's about three or four in each room. And what I'd love you to do is to, um, in your breakout rooms, just start to unpack this a little bit. What elements, stand out for you? Um, what are obvious ones to you? The ones that are kind of givens when it comes to emotional resilience. And what is slightly more surprising? Which elements are slightly more surprising to you? So just to have a conversation about those in your yeah. groups and then we can come back into the space. Um, we'll have about, let's have about, uh, oh, let's, at least 15 minutes, Might make it longer, we'll see. This is an age group. Okay, any questions before we go? So what elements stand out for us here and what are the givens and what are more surprising elements? Okay, off you go.